Now, most people have heard of the Banshee. And of course, the Banshee was supposed to be the death warner for the O's and the Max, those ancient Irish families. But that's not true. That's not true. There are an awful lot more families than the O's and the Max who claim the Banshee. And why? Very, very simply. Because people were proud of having a Banshee. If you had a Banshee, it proved you were real Irish. And that's the reason why a lot of Anglo-Irish families wanted a Banshee. We really belong in this country if we have a Banshee. That was the thinking behind it. Especially if they had displaced Irish people of that land. Now, I was told this story by an old man in Crusheen in County Clare, where I come from. Now, it happened to him, he said, when he was a young boy. He hated school. Now, that's nothing strange. Most people do when they're young. And his father and his two uncles were cattle drovers at a time when there was no cattle uh, trucks. And they delivered cattle and sold cattle for this man or for sometimes themselves or for you or for me. They would deliver them and they were good at their job. But it was a hard livelihood because who after all would want to be out under hail, rain and snow? But I tell you this, we don't realise how tough it was to make a living in Ireland in those days. Anyway, the young boy, as I said, he hated school. That's what he told me. And uh, to make all worse, you see, in those days, there was no such thing as psychology in schools. All there was, he said, was a big stick. And if you didn't like school, tough for you, uh, the stick would be worked on you. Uh, if there was an academic child at school at that time, good for him. The master or the mistress would be on his side. If, on the other hand, you were the kind of child who was uh, active, wanted to be out there, bad for you. Because a child like that more than likely would get a hammering because they just weren't able to do their school work. He was one of those children. He'd rather be looking out the window and worried about, where's my father today? What's he doing today? But his father, when the boy asked, can I go, can I go, can I go with you? No, no, you're staying at school. You're going to get a bit of education. And you'd say, why? For the simple reason that the father knew that this kind of job wasn't a nice job. It was a horrible job to be, as I said, out under all weathers. The boy, he didn't appreciate that at all. He was there miserable, miserable at school. But, but, he said, an accident happened. It was coming up towards the month of November and one of the uncles got the flu. He must have been out, as I say, under miserable weather. He got the flu and the boy saw his chance. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. He says, um, I'll go with you to the fair of Gort. Now, Gott wasn't so far away. Where they lived in Crusheen, Gott was only about mm, 12 miles away. And the father, the father was stuck uh, because a problem was, you see, with driving cattle, and still would be, is you need three people for the very simple reason that one to drive, and when you come to a crossroads, you need one there and one here because the cattle will scatter. And that's why the two uncles and the father used to always walk together. No, there was only one uncle and the father. Now, the father, as I said, he was caught. And he didn't want to take the boy with him, but what could he do? Because the neighbours were all busy with their own cattle. So he says, all right, I'll take you today. But, he says, this is going to be a long day. And I don't want to hear any complaint out of you, because you'll get no sympathy. Oh, the boy, of course, was delighted. <laughs> he was going to do a man's work for once. Little did he know that the father was out to teach him a lesson that he'd never forget. Anyway, they were up the following morning at half past five in the morning. It was dark. November's morning, dark. The cattle had been collected in the little field outside the night before, all ready to go. The mother had the breakfast ready and, and... They were on the road at half past five. Now, you'd be inclined to say to yourself, why at such an early hour? Very simple. Because the father wanted to be in Gort at half past eight. 
to get his perch under the railway bridge in the street because the railway bridge passes over the street in Gort and the father had his own place usually under that. Because remember, month of November, more than likely wet and there was a bit of shelter under the bridge. So that was where the father would usually have the cattle because remember all the fairs would be held on the street at that time. Matt only came later. So anyway, on they went. They'd have three hours to get there. Three hours, you know, for 12 miles. But cattle are cattle and they'll be going this way and that way and there was eight crossroads between where they were and got. That would slow them down as well. So anyway, they went and now, in fairness to the boy, he was good. The father would tell him when they were coming up their crossroads, on, on. And the boy, being young and lively, he'd be up there, he'd be up there first. And the father was pleased with the progress. Uh, he didn't say so. He didn't say so. No praise, no praise. And on, and on, and on they went. And they were in Gott at half past eight. And they did find their place under the railway bridge. Now came the second part of what had to be done. Now the father says, uh, now your job, he said to the boy, is keep our cattle apart from that man's cattle. Now the boy, remember, had never been at a cattle fair before. And when cattle are milling around, there was a lot of cattle on the street, uh, milling around here and there, uh, uh, yeah, there'd be a <laughs> and you know, if you're standing in the way, you'll be, you'll, you'll be, you know what, you'll be shat on. And the poor boy, he had many very near misses. Uh, he wasn't used to it. An older man would know what to do, no problem at all. But the poor boy, he, he, he had trouble uh, avoiding this, never mind keeping the cattle separated. And the father was watching all of this, quietly amused. Teach the boy a lesson that he wouldn't want to be repeated. So anyway, the day went on. It wasn't a good fair. There weren't many buyers. People came to look at the old cattle, all right, and you know, how much do you want for them? Uh, yeah, they didn't get what they wanted. You know, the cattle were abused. How much do you want for them greyhounds? You know, the usual kind of thing, make little of them. And that's what you're talking about. They're the finest cattle in the street. And was, mm, 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 mm. But they didn't sell the cattle. And it went on, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. The Angelus rang at 12. No sale, one, two, three, four. And it was about five o'clock in the evening when they finally sold the cattle. Not the price they wanted, but they sold. And then they had to take them up to the railway station, put them on board the wagons, sign the old dockets, not get paid there. They brought down the young lad, down to a pub, and there they met the buyer and they got paid. So anyway, the pub was packed of people because uh, on a fair day, all the pubs would be crowded. And not just that, but on a fair day, every pub had an extension to their license. So with a bit of money, the drinking went on and on and on, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. And of course the boy, he was there in the corner and every so often he'd get a bottle of orange there just to shut him up. And the place full of smoke and talk and the boy, he knew nobody. The father and the uncle knew everybody. The boy was forgotten. Every so often, Dad, uh, can we go home? No, we'll be going home when we're going home. Eh? And he'd get another bottle of orange to shut him up. And the time went on, one o'clock, two o'clock, and finally around two o'clock in the morning, they were thrown out. Now remember, they had been on the road since half past five the previous morning, nearly 24 hours. And the poor boy, he told me himself, he was just, uh, yeah, yeah. Founded, but and starved and starved as well as that. But finally, they were thrown out, and he said to me, You know, he was there uh, uh, on the footpath, and he said, Do you think anybody picked me up to take me home? There were still 12 miles to walk home, and I had to walk every step of it myself. <laughs> the father teaching him a lesson. Yeah. The boy didn't know that, but he walked it. And when finally they arrived in the little boreen, in the passageway, in to home, he could see the light in the window. It was dawning day now. Nearly 24 hours later, it was, he couldn't remember what time, but it must have been around the half past five again. There was the light in the window. The mother must have been making the breakfast. 
And as they walked in, the little Boreen, uh, his father and himself in front and the uncle behind, what did they see? Sitting on the wall on the left hand side, this woman, and she combing, combing her hair. And they stopped because it certainly wasn't their mother. And it wasn't any woman local that they knew. And they looked at her. Now, he told me I was beside my father. And my father shoved over to the right hand side of the Boreen. The Boreen was narrow anyway. And as we passed her, my father saluted her. No salute. She just kept combing and combing her hair, long grey hair. I remember it well, he says. I could never forget it. No salute. We walked past. Now my uncle was behind us and he saluted her. No salute. Now my uncle was a very different kind of a man than my father. And, ah, now I don't know, was it the drink or not? But I doubt it because after walking 12 miles, <laughs> any drink drank would have worn off. He saluted her and when he got no reply, what did he do? Only over he went and he snapped the comb out of her hand. And as soon as he did, this crying started. This lonesome, lonesome, this, this, oh, and immediately we ran for the door. We had three of us ran for the door. And by the Lord Christ, he says, we nearly put in the door and the jams of the door in around the kitchen. Now, the one thing I can remember, he says, is there was my mother inside at the fireplace, big open fireplace, and she's stirring a pot. And as soon as we burst in the door, she looked at us and she saw the comb in my uncle's hand and she said, what in Christ's name are you after doing? Close the door, close the door, quick. And my father kicked out the door and suddenly the crying surrounded the house, the same lonesome, lonesome crying. And she said, what did you do? And my uncle, my uncle said, I, I, I give it back. And he made for the door and she said, stop, don't, don't. It was a lucky thing my mother kept her wits about her that night, a hot morning, I should say. And over she went to the fireplace and she took up the tongs, one of the old style tongs made by the local blacksmith, heavy, heavy tongs. And she said, give me that. And she put the comb on the tongs and she said, open the door, small bit. And my father opened the door a couple of inches and she put the comb on the tongs, out the door, and all of a sudden, it was snapped out of her hand, and she slammed the door out. And all of a sudden, the crying stopped. Now, I remember, he says, like it was yesterday, the silence. And it seemed to go on and on and on. It probably didn't. It probably didn't. But it was only that we were... We were probably in, in, in shock. But, again, it was my mother was the first to move. And she went over to the window. Now, there was timber shutters in the house at the time. Small window and timber shutters. And she opened the shutters very carefully. And it had dawned day. And she looked out, out at the old footpath, small bit of a footpath outside. And she looked, and she looked down, and there below, below the window, was the tongs. Solid iron tongs that you couldn't possibly bend over your knee. And there it was twisted into an S-hook. And she called my uncle. Mir, she said, Mir, Mir. And look at that, she said. And she said to him, if you had put out that comb with your hand, you wouldn't have an arm now. That was the banshee, she said, you idiot. Why didn't you leave her alone? Why couldn't you have stopped interfering with what she was doing? Mind your own business and leave her mind her business. And that man, he told me that story. He said, that happened to myself. He says, I was there with my father. That happened, he says. And anyone who will tell you that the banshee don't exist, he said, that person is talking Ramesh. Nonsense. So he said, that cured me of not wanting to go to school.